Hi, this is Bruce Boxleitner, and you're listening to Then Is Now podcast. Rise and shine, my sinners. When Father Evil starts his day, he gets a little deadly. Deadly Grounds Coffee has the richest, smoothest flavor you'll find anywhere. It's sinfully delicious. Once you go deadly, you never go back. Order yours at getdeadly.com. Coffee's so good, it's scary. What kind of a sick school is this? Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. You got spunk. I hate spunk. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Oh, righty then. How you doing? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Say hello to my little friend. I love to celebrate fun in the morning. What are you people? On dope? Stop whining. I got a crap on deck that can choke a donkey. Hey! Who is your daddy? I'm sorry, but all questions must be submitted in writing. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Can I do that? I'll be back. A dynamite! Show me the money! Don't! Up your nose when you have the phone. A what? I'm sailing! I'm sailing! Groovy. You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it. Pull it down. Love means never having to say you're sorry. Here's looking at you, kid. We got no food. We got no jobs. Our pets' heads are falling off! Go to the coast. We get together. Have a few laughs. Hear that, Elizabeth? <laughs> I'm coming to join you, honey. I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. I love it when a plan comes together. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Put it up to 11. 11, exactly. One louder. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. We're on a mission from God. Hello and welcome to episode 101 of Then Is Now podcast. Sadly, my co-host Chris could not be here today as our guest is from England, and so I had to schedule the recording for 1 p.m., which is 6 o'clock her time. So briefly, just to remind the listeners, we've started a live streaming show called Fright Lounge, which streams the first Sunday of every month. Bill Van Rin from the Drive-In Asylum Double Feature is my co-host on that. And we always have fun guests and topics, and if you're not sure that you want to watch horror movies or you're a seasoned horror fan, then Fright Lounge is the show for you. Okay, so let's get on to today's show. We've got a special guest today who's a British actress that's perhaps best known for her appearances in several horror films in the 1970s. She's still working today and has quite the impressive resume. So sit back and get ready for an interview with a wonderful horror icon. Class is in session. I have a bad feeling about this. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? Food fight! Hey, you in my class? Oh, yeah, I am today. I think you should consider transferring to shop class. Woo -woo! Now, now, very few students are severely injured in shop class. Bueller. When you were in school. Bueller. Did you ever cut class? Bueller. Yeah, I guess I did. Sure, most kids cut classes. Good, sign this. Um, he's sick. I get so lonely when I hear that third attendance bell oh. ring and all my kids are not here. Seven years of college down the drain. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. You lack discipline. As long as I'm here, there will be no grades or gold stars or demerits. We're going to have recess all the time. Woo! Go, play and have fun now. The very thought of vampires makes your flesh creep. We call them the undead. They are vampires. If you think all vampires are ugly creatures of the night, then you're in for a shattering surprise. Now, 
this fresh, warm blood into a body of thy making. Welcome to the most exclusive finishing school in Europe, where the quest for knowledge continues long into the night. You see, I have studied your magic. I know the black art, and I want only to know more and more. Here, the masters are quick to recognize an outstanding pupil. The portrait of Camilla Karnstein died 1710, 120 years ago. Do you know who the portrait was of, Mirkala? It was you. Welcome to the finishing school, where they really do finish you. I spent the whole of last night going through Giles' researches. And believe me, they are powerful evidence. Evidence? Of what? That you are a vampire. You say that. And tell me you love me. Prove to me that you're not. Love me. Okay, folks, our guest today is an amazing actress. While she was on a couple of TV shows in the late 1960s, she got her breakout role in the 1969 psychological thriller noir film, The Exquisite Cadaver. In the 1970s, she appeared in the Hammer Horror films Lust for a Vampire and Twins of Evil. Her other films include F The Flesh and Blood Show, The House That Vanished, a.k.a. Scream and Die, Crucible of Terror, Confessions of a Window Cleaner, and Percy's Progress, among many others. Her television work includes Coronation Street, The Professionals, and Blake Seven, also among many others. Her theater work is extensive and includes British, a British tour of the comedy Boeing Boeing, Ray Cooney's Chase Me Comrade, and Alan Ayakbom's Bedroom Farce. In 1979, she played leading parts at the Donovan Mall Theater in Nairobi, Kenya for a whole season. She lived in South Africa from 1996 to 2003, and in 2016, she was the narrator for Encounter, the architecture and design radio series from Monitor Production and Sound. Our guest also often attends film and television conventions and Hammer Film events as a guest. In 2017, she and fellow Hammer actress Caroline Monroe acted in a short horror spoof called Frankula, produced by the Misty Moon Film Society, of which she is an honorary patron. In 2019, she took part in a new documentary about Peter Cushing called Peter Cushing in His Own Words and discussed her work with him. She also has an interview about her work, and in particular the film Lust for a Vampire, which was part of the 2019 Blu-ray release. She recently had a cameo in the 2020 feature film The Haunting of Margam Castle. There's a lot more that she's done, and hopefully we'll get to that in the interview. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the show pop culture icon and scream queen, Judy Matheson. Welcome, Judy. Oh, wow. What an introduction, Roger. Thank you so much. Yes, that was uh, that was lovely. You're welcome. I hope I'll get a recording of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm glad to have you here today. So uh, one of the first things we always like to ask new guests on this show is, uh, when did you first get the acting bug, and what was the path like to becoming a professional actress? Well, I did it at school. It's sort of classic. My, it's really classic, my, my pathway, as you call it. I did it at school. I loved it. I was quite good at it. My school was very good at that. They would enter act, uh, you know, actresses, uh, you know, your, your little girls into festivals and you'd get prizes. And, and it, well, I really got the bug there. And then um, I got into a drama school, which gave you a teaching degree, which was good because uh, the county council that I lived in would give you only a a grant. This was the 60s, so when they gave grants for this sort of thing, right. if you had a, a proper degree. So I did that. It was very conventional. It's quite interesting because I've recently done um, a, 
sort of um, talk, a, a chat show with other Hammer actresses and um, people like Carolyn Monroe and, um, um, uh, well, lots of, I mean, lots of very, very wonderful ladies. And I seemed to be the only one that was going the conventional route through drama school. The others were discovered just by being beautiful. They turned out to be really talented as well, but, um, and models and all that sort of thing. So mine's very, very conventional and pretty boring, really. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so I, I'm sure you've been asked a thousand times questions about these films, but we, this show does kind of have a horror slant to it. So I did want to ask you a little bit about some of your early 70s horror work, if that's OK. Indeed. OK. <laughs> so what can you tell about us about The Exquisite Cadaver? I had never actually heard of that film and I couldn't find it to watch it. I was in preparation for this. No, it's interesting. It's interesting that it's not around. I have um, I have an inkling that this is a secret. It might not be true, but I'm doing a film festival in October, and I think they may have it to show, which is wonderful. It's a wonderful. It's it is. It was done. It was given DVD by an American and <clears throat> weird American firm called Something Weird Video, oh, okay. and they and and they now put it on as a download. It's actually a rather wonderful film, and it's a wonderful film nowadays because it's very feminist i didn't realize at the time when i was doing it but it had three uh, stonking great female leads and it's very feminist and it's very weird and it's very noirish and it's very spanish and i find it fascinating <laughs> um, but maybe i would anyway I, uh, funnily enough on on twitter today there was somebody put a photograph of capucine who was my my uh, who i played opposite uh, up a little a little gif on just now just now and i said just imagine your first proper film job being a lead opposite this amazing woman and i just did that uh, like five minutes ago it's on twitter uh it was an amazing experience it's a really lovely film i'm very very loyal about it because and the and the director was a guy called Vicente Aranda, which uh, he was a very, very sort of respected intellectual in in Barcelona in Spain. So it was everything was good about it. Excellent. And did you shoot on location in Spain? We shot it on location in Barcelona and um, just south of Barcelona. Um, uh, yeah, or in at the beach sometimes. So, you know, we, yeah, we. But basically, it was local. It was local. Then, actually, I'm not, I'm not sure how interesting this is. <laughs> we <laughs> chosen by Spain to be in the San Sebastian. Their entry in the San Sebastian Film Festival that year. The San Sebastian Film Festival is a huge festival now, as you probably know. Yeah. But then it was so huge, but it was the Sp Spanish entry. So that was a bit of an honor as well. And we all turned up. We had to turn up. And I was in my 60s, my 60s Kings Road gear, uh, which may may or may not have been appropriate, but it was a wonderful experience. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it sounds like it would be fun. Um, so then, you, you know, you did Coronation Street and another TV show, and then um, you went into Lust for a Vampire and Twins okay. of Evil. Did you know those were part of a trilogy? No, no. In fact, uh, one was told very little. Very little about it at all. I got a part in uh, *Lust for a Vampire*. There was there were three named schoolgirls, and the others were all actually actresses, but they didn't they weren't named, and they didn't really do as much. And um, I didn't know anything about it. But it was um, you've got you've got the date, but it was in the summer of maybe 1971. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Actually, the date where it was. Uh, uh, finished filming was just a few days ago. Somebody put that up. You know, Twitter is huge about these things. But um, it was a wonderful experience. It was, it was sunny. We were all wearing wonderful clothes. We were all wearing wonderful hair. We were made a big fuss of. We all got, um, uh, you know, on really, really well. The girls, loads of girls getting on, everybody um, getting on well. It was a huge, fun shoot. I knew nothing about anything except that I was sort of met these producers and got cast in it. But since I have read and heard that it had a few problems with the production, but we didn't know about any of that. We just had good time. It was just huge fun. That's awesome. That's awesome. So which one did you do first? Was it Lust for a Vampire first or Twins of Evil? 
it was Lust for a Vampire okay. first. And there was one before that, wasn't it? It was a yeah, Vampire the, Lover. Yes. Vampire Lover. Yeah. With Madeleine Smith, who was one of the ladies that I was talking about, was on the stage with me when we were talking about how we, uh, how we started in the business. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. She's fabulous, by the way, Madeleine Smith. They're all fabulous. The Hammer, Hammer ladies that are around now, they're all fabulous. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you, you sort of, um, your opening role in Twins of Evil is sort of iconic now, wouldn't you say? <laughs> it's iconic and it is only opening. It's exactly <laughs> right. No, there's no finishing role, is there? It's, but it is amazing, isn't it? I didn't know that at the time. Um, at the time, I met the producers to talk about it. And, of course, the producers already knew me from Lust for Vampire, same two producers, not the directors, interesting enough but the producers and they sort of offered me you know over over a chat three parts the three smaller parts and um i don't know if they were offering it to me or, or they seemed to be offering it to me but then i said oh well i really really want the role that's got the little part with peter cushing who was an you know a complete icon even then and so that's how i got that i didn't know it was the pre-credit sequence uh, i didn't know anything about it but now i just just exactly as you say, Roger, it's, it's become a bit iconic, that scene, even though it's not very long. And it is the pre-credit sequence. And I might say the credit sequence. Right, right. And so what was Peter Cushing like to work with? I'm sure you've been asked that a thousand times, but I, I, I know my listeners will want to know. Roger, I have been asked that a thousand times. <laughs> but I have. But I have. But he, uh, all I can say is that he didn't do Lust for a Vampire. You probably know this because he's, his wife was very, very ill. Uh, he was supposed to play. He was supposed to play a part in that, but he didn't. He, he wasn't. So he was replaced by Ralph Bates, who was terrific, but he's not Peter Cushing. Um, so when he came to do Twins of Evil, he had lost his wife. He was bereaved. He never apparently got really over that. I mean, he was always a sad man. Right. But with me, um, he couldn't have been nicer, sweeter. Looking after me, he knew I had to have a few sort of like was thrown to the ground, had a few guys roughing me up, and then I was on this burning business. And he had to be horrible to me. And he was just so sweet, and he kept saying, are you all right? And we had a little chats when we were sort of sitting by the side of the set. And he was just so gentle. And he also, he, he, you know, I've said this before, that, you know, he was a gentle man in two words. He was such a sweet man. The, the interesting thing about that for me, as I count myself, Roger, as a serious actress, was how he changed in the instant that the director called action, this face changed. And if you, if anybody, if you know that, beginning of that film yeah. where he appears at the door and I'm some little girl sitting around in her little cottage and he appears at that door and he is completely terrifying and then she, this girl whoever she is she gets dragged before him and he rips her cross off if you remember that yeah and it was terrifying and that's so wonderful for an actor I mean because that's what you want you actually want want somebody but you know 10 minutes before he'd been being this sweet guy but that made it almost more terrifying huh. that he had been this sweet, caring little man. Not little, obviously, but he was not, you know, this huge presence until the director called action. And then he was this huge presence and he was totally terrifying. So the whole thing was uh, easy to do in that sense because he was so brilliant. Right, right. I mean, even later in the film, too, when he um, he just had this sense of menace about him. And um, one thing I did like about this particular film was that, um, and I, I hadn't seen these in a long time, so I rewatched them, um, you know, in preparation for this. And his character actually has an arc, and he changes, and he kind of realizes, like maybe we were being a bit hasty in burning all these girls without learning, f you know, truly verifying whether or not they're witches or, or vampires, you know. Uh, he has a bit of regret. He has a bit of regret. Well, well, it's very interesting. If if you go into it sort of quite deeply, those guys, him and his guys that come on horseback, and isn't the music wonderful? The music is wonderful. Oh yeah. Um, if you um, you know, they are they're the good guys. I mean, that's that's the wonderful sort of juxtaposition and dichotomy of the film. I think is they're the good guys in it, and right. they're not. So I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. Oh, it's very interesting. 
So let's talk a little bit about um, the Crucible of Evil. I just actually watched that last night and uh, <laughs> really enjoyed that. And you had a mo- you had a more substantial role in that film. Did you not? Um, it's Crucible of Terror. You, Crucible of Terror. Watch, I'm sorry. Did you, did you watch the wrong film? No, no. I, my eyes were looking at my notes, <laughs> and Twins of Evil was ri- right above it, so my my eyes shifted. Yes, Crucible Wait, of Terror. It, there is a crucible of something else that came out soon afterwards. I think no crucible of terror was, you know, it was it was all right. It was fine. It was absolutely fine. I did have. Uh, oh no, I'm th- uh, yeah. No, I'm going ahead here. No, it was a, quite a nice role. That that was a nice role because I was playing the bitch, which yeah. <laughs> I I loved. I loved. I was the bitch, and uh, it was a very interesting shoot because. Um, we all got on really well, except for Mike Rain, who was, took himself too seriously. But there were very, very good actors in it. You've got James Bolam and you've got Jim, uh, um, Ronnie Lacey, yep. English, British actors who were wonderful actors in our view in, the, in, in Britain. And it was huge fun because we filmed it in Cornwall, which is really pretty edge of the edge of the sort of edge of the British Isles. And it was really lovely. We had huge fun doing it. Uh, the lead lady in it is Mary Maud, who, who is to this day, Roger, my best friend. And, um, I still, and she, and another thing is that she, the, the, um, assistant director, the second assistant director, not the first assistant director, was a pain in the neck, you know, as far <laughs> as I was concerned. I was obviously a little bit assertive. I was sort of always throwing my weight around. I think, I don't think that's good, but, I, you know, I think I was. And um, I kept complaining about him and saying he's so bossy and he's doing this and he's doing that. Uh, blow me if six months later Mary Moore didn't marry him. So <laughs> there we are. That's a little story. And um, <laughs> they were married for many years, but sadly he died, Gary, um, oh. a, couple, a couple of years ago. But you know, we all we, we all got on so well, and we all. Um, you know, Gary, Mary, and I were friends for for years and years and years afterwards. Wow, that's great. And I liked it. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I liked it because she was a bit she was a bit cool. You know, I was. I'm, I think I was always better at being a bit of a bitch, a bit cool, um, not the ingenue, just to say. Right. Just to throw that. In. <laughs> and you mentioned uh, Ronnie Lacey earlier, and I'm watching the film and the scene where you're throwing the rocks at him. And I thought it was great. And then um, I'm looking at him. I'm like, why does this guy look so familiar to me? And then when I finally looked it up, he played Tot in Raiders of the Lost Ark, who was sort Indeed. of a real creepy bad guy. Indeed, with my ex-husband, Paul Freeman. Oh, who's, okay. who I'm still, uh, You know, who was the French man in it. So he was the third lead. Right. Uh, and, right. He was play- and he was working with Ronnie Lacey. So we had lots of conversations about that. I have to say, I only throw the fact that he's my ex-husband in because we're still best of friends. Oh, that's good. That's and awesome. He's, and he's a wonderful actor, as you know, Paul Freeman. Right, right. Wow, that's amazing. So on, on, on these three films, um, what can you tell me, uh, maybe you know, separate it out, but the, the locations that you were at, um, you know, Lust for a Vampire is a very different location than Twins of Evil, and it's very different from um, Crucible of Terror. So what can you tell me a little bit about the location work that you did and what it was, what it was like? Lust for a Vampire was entirely, from my point of view, in, on location in a wonderful country house, which is now, I believe, a hotel, but still shows people around for fat, Hammer fans. Um, it was just beautiful. So, um, you know, we that's how it was. Uh, as I said to you earlier, it was sunny. It was beautiful. We were taken to this. Uh, we didn't stay there, but we were taken to this location every day. And it was lovely. In Twins of Evil, we were, it was out of um, Pinewood, I think. Okay. So, so the fire, I think, was in Pinewood on a lot. But a lot of it was in was all, all in a place called Black Forest, and it's called Black Forest or something, and it's just outside Pinewood. And you'll find it's used in so many Hammer horror films. So that that yeah, and as I said, Crucible of Terror was on the Cornish coast. E- even today, people sort of talk about it and say, "Oh, I, rem- I remember, I remember that place." It's um, you know, the tin mines and tin mining is all around there, and people. People love the location, actually, of Crucible of Terror. So, yeah, locations are important, I think. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, just moving on a little bit here, uh, you have a couple more horror films I wanted to just briefly touch upon. Um, you were in The House That Vanished, which when I looked it up, it was kind of hard. I can't find a copy of it, but it's also known as Scream and Die um, from 1970. Yep. Well, I have conflicting. Some say 1973 and some sources say 74. Yeah. So I'm not yeah. sure. About... <laughs> no, I'm not sure either, to be honest, because it's all part. <laughs> One of the things I say, Roger, is all part of a jobbing actress's life, you know, and I can't always remember exactly because there are always things coming up in between. Right. You know, you were doing commercials, you're doing uh, adverts, or uh, you were doing um, um, corporate films, and uh, you're doing a bit of theatre. So I mean, I can't always remember. Um, that that was quite an interesting film in as far as he's got. Uh, his name's Jose Larez, Larez, the director, and he's got a really good reputation amongst some cognoscenti. And um, he, he, you know, this, this film, somebody put it up again. I keep talking about Twitter, but uh, somebody put it up recently and said, you know, what an interesting film it was and they wished it would have a Blu-ray and things. For me, it was the most unhappy of my filming experiences because the director was a sort of, was, was not an attractive guy. He was, um, he was Spanish. He was very autocratic. He was very uh, voyeuristic, hmm. and I was a sort of I was a sort of feminist, seventies feminist, really, which is surprising given some of the films I did. But <laughs> I was, and I, I really well, we didn't get on very well, so it was an unhappy experience. Having having said that, I spoke to three separate actresses that I've met at conventions who worked with him, and they all say the same thing. Hmm. So, uh, and I and he's uh, you know he's. We we have lost him, as they say. So um, I have no hesitation in saying he was really unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's too bad. You know, it's these things are supposed to be. I know it's work, but it should be fun too while you're doing it. Yeah, fun. Fun is exactly it, Roger. That's what I've always looked for. Yeah, absolutely. So the other one, and I'm dying to see this movie, and I, I, I guess the only way to watch it is to get it on Blu-ray. Um, when I discovered it, it was too late in order to order it in time for the show here. But um, it's called The Flesh and Blood Show in 1972. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. you know, first of all, um, I, I'd love you to tell us about that. But also, I would want to know if you were able to or if you had scenes with Tristan Rogers in that movie. Uh, yeah, I did. I did. I did. I don't remember much about him, to be honest. And somebody recently, not unlike yourself, um, asked me my memories of him. But I didn't have a lot of scenes with him. But I did. Somebody... Look, I, I keep doing this. You can, you can actually cut it out. But only today, just now, an hour ago, somebody put up a picture of the Flesh and Blood show. And I'm not quite sure of the context of, the, of what they're doing. And I'll go back and look at it. Uh, with Tristan Rogers in it and Robin Asquith and, um, and me in, in, in the Flesh and Blood show. I think, I think I had lots of scenes with him. I think we were all sort of hanging around in the theatre. Um, yeah. That was quite good fun. That was that 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 worked out well, I think. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, because he's one of my favorite actors. He's on General Hospital. Is he? Yeah, he's on oh, well, General Hospital. Yeah. I've been watching it since the uh, 1981. He's been on there since like 1979, 1980, and he's still on there now. You know, comes comes and goes, but um, he's like one of the best characters. He's just this cool guy named Robert Scorpio, and it, he's just a great actor. You know. Oh, Roger, I didn't know that, but I find that quite thrilling because. You know, the thing about him, I can't remember very much because we didn't actually have... He had scenes with my very good friend, Lou Ann Peters. He was sort of partnered with her in the film, which you, if you look at the film, it's quite a naughty little film, but it's um, by a very cult director in this country called um, uh, Pete Walker. And he's, he's very much a cult director here. And he had some scenes with my lovely friend, Lou Ann Peters. But we did have some group scenes together. We were all actors in a theatre, in a theatre on a pier. And he was, you know, what I remember about Tristan is he was really, really nice, easygoing. You know, you had to get on well with all these people, which we did. We did. Everybody got on really well. Another thing like Lust for Vampire, all the actors getting on. And he was he was very much part of that. He was such an easygoing guy, he was such a nice guy and great to work with. Nice, nice. And you had a bunch of screen queens in that movie too, right? That was the one with Jenny Hanley and Candace Gladning and Luann Peters? Yeah, all those people. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> yes, that's right. I don't. I, we didn't think of ourselves then as screen queens right. at all. Uh, uh, Luanne did loads of things. I mean, she was fantastically talented, and she was also known a little bit over here as a as a singer. So she was. Uh, Candace, yes, she did. She, but Candace also did a lot of serious television. But then she's dropped out of of any sort of publicity like we're doing now. But there is a little bit of talk that she might come back after like 40 years because somebody's done a book about her and uh, she might come back. And he would say, oh, yeah, Jenny, Jenny, weirdly, because she's really sort of um, she's done so many things, Jenny. She was also one of the people on that on that uh, stage who was discussing how they came into it. And she's she's a Bond girl, she's a Hammer girl, right. but mainly in this country, Jenny Hanley is known for doing a children's show, a children's sort of topical, uh, everyday. You know, she was a, a children's presenter, really. So, uh, and she's fabulous, yes. But I didn't have anything much to do with Jenny Hanley. She, if you don't, you haven't seen the film. But she had a sort of separate part in a way. Uh, no, she was part of us in the in the theatre, but yeah, no, well. So it is weird. Uh, we've all gone on to uh, be screen queens. Right. right. And I've you spotted something. I'm sorry, say that again? You spotted something there. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the last woman I neglected to mention was um, Penny Meredith, who um, oh, right. I remember her from doing some Benny Hill stuff, you know. <laughs> That's clever. That yeah. is clever. I've got to tell you, and you may not want to know this, but um, on Saturday, this Saturday... I'm going to be doing, a, a, well, I'm going to be looking at excerpts from a film that's coming out in the autumn. And, um, it's got, it's, a, and it's being presented at Leicester Square, uh, on, on Saturday coming, uh, in a, in a cinema there as part of a film festival. And it's called Keeping the British End Up. And it's really about sex comedies of the seventies. I think that's what it's about. And it's by, brilliant director called Simon Sheridan but I think Penny Meredith might be part of that I'm not sure I'm not sure but he'd, I, I do know that Simon the director did ring me up and ask me about her so I don't know if she's in it but may have come full circle from you talking about it my never hearing about <laughs> her for all the time so we'll see interesting interesting they'll probably touch up on the uh the carry on movies which I really love those films do you yeah I <laughs> quite <laughs> I like all of these things. They're an acquired taste. Yeah, yeah. So um, you were in a film called The Chairman prior to all this in 1969. Uh, did you get a chance to meet Gregory Peck? When Indeed, you... but, I mean, briefly. <laughs> no, it was amazing. I mean, I did, you know, it was my, my very, very first experience of filming at all. And, I mean, I have to say it's pretty hot stuff, really. J. Lee Thompson and me turn up. There's a, <clears throat> an, another actress who was with my agent called Janet Key, who was also with the, my first job, Bristol Old Vic, with the theatre. We toured your beautiful country and we toured really all sorts of places with us. So Janet was a friend of mine and she and I had been sent along by our agent to sit more or less as extras, but we were given one line each uh, to be students in London University. They used, they used a lecture room there. Um, Gregory Peck and Anne, Anne what's her name? Anne. English actress, I've forgotten her name now, but she, but she, um, and yeah, we did one day with Gregory Peck, and of course, he comes in this huge star. God, we're all fainting, I'm fainting now. <laughs> and he comes around, there's a group of students, some of them are sort of just extras, really, but there's Janet and me with our proud one lines. And he shook all our hands and said, Hello, I'm, Gre I'm Gregory Peck, like these stars do, they introduce themselves like you don't know who they are. Hello, I'm Gregory. How are you? <laughs> but that's all. Then, then we did. What was interesting for a new, a new actress and somebody who took us, I did my whole line has always been I took myself seriously as an actress. It was watching him work because Gregory Peck was a bit of a hero anyway by then. I mean, he's the hugest film star in the world at the time, you know, one oh, yeah. of them. And he, um, he kept doing this, uh, J. Lee Thompson kept making him do this take where he came into the lecture room and talked, Anne Haywood, um, yes. to Anne yep. And he kept, he kept, he, and they did it time and time again. Now, I hadn't done films before, so this bemused me that he had to keep doing it. Every single time Gregory Peck did it, he did it differently with a bit of flair here, yeah, uh, you know, a different emphasis here. 
absolutely brilliant. And I was, my eyes were popping out because I was watching this actor be absolutely amazing. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting lesson, really. That's awesome. That's so cool. Oh, my God. So uh, moving on to some of your TV shows, um, uh, before I mention the one that's my particular favorite, um, a lot of them for me, I, I mean, I grew up watching a lot of British television and British comedies, that sort of thing. Um, but the one I hadn't heard of that apparently you made a real splash with was called Z Cars. And <laughs> can you tell us about that a little bit? Well, it, was a, it was a cop show, right? Yeah, it was a every day sort of show came on every week. Z cars, we call it here. Z oh, okay. cars, Z cars, and it was it was like it, it was it was on for years and years. I think, um, yeah, it went on and on. And I I I haven't quite got the years in my head. Maybe seventy six and seventy eight. Weirdly, yes. I got two different parts. I got two different parts. I was given a part of a stripper, a stripper in the first one, and I'd known this director because he'd nearly cast me several years before in in a very big thing in in British television called Take Three Girls. And I'd got there and I'd got there and then I didn't get the part. Somebody didn't like it or something. But he always obviously felt guilty because he gave me this wonderful part in this first, the first said cars. But it was part of a stripper, a tarty, a very tarty girl, which I love playing anyway. <laughs> but I could have done a lot more of those, really. A tarty girl who was a stripper. But you know what happened? It was the BBC. It's the BBC. Um you know, I said, oh, well, yeah, I can do that. I can do a bit of stripping. I can do it to baby love. I can do it to any Motown thing. He said, no, 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 <laughs> you've got to do it professionally. <laughs> so he, the, the BBC paid for a professional strip artist from Soho in London to come in and give me lessons. And I go down to this sort of dungeon in Soho for a week and get lessons in taking my clothes off, which was wonderful. I mean, how, how many other people get that sort of experience? <laughs> So I did that. That was a lovely little part, playing a Liverpool stripper, which I loved. And then the next one, yeah, I, uh, it was um, it was you were the, you were the a wife of a gangster. Yeah, no, that was and that yeah, no, the first one. Yeah, I'm confused here. That was the second one, which was my favourite part. The first one was also the wife of a gangster, which was lovely. Also, a director I'd worked for before. Um, in Crossroads, I think. But anyway, it was, it was that was, sorry, you, you completely straightened that. Wife of a gangster, the tarty wife again, yeah. Liverpool North girl. Uh, and I loved that too. And I've seen that back since. It's amazing. You know, it's amazing to be my age, Roger, and be able to look back at you doing these bits of sort of acting, which is great. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And it, one thing I read online, there was sort of an analysis of your, of your portrayal in both roles is that you were able to sort of, um, you know, take ownership of your sex appeal and use it to control men, um, you know, to, to stop misogyny. And, and, you know, instead of um, a female character that would traditionally be objectified in those days. Oh, gosh, I'd like to read that. Oh, no, I don't know about that. I can't tell. I mean, I was, I was, as I actually did allude to earlier, I, I was a little bit of a sort of a feminist sort of, um, yeah, you know, the 70s, the 70s, you may remember, you had, um, Americans had the best people like Gloria Steinem and all those people. Uh, we, you know, we were all a bit of, um, I, well, certainly I was quite political, still am. And, um yeah, I, I I was a bit of a feminist, which is possibly why I didn't always get on with people like Jose Larraz, that Spanish director. <laughs> and so it's very flattering to hear that thing that you've just said, that I took control, because I always felt that, looking back on it too. I mean, there were things like Confessions of a Window Cleaner, which which is which is a naughty film, and I didn't ever feel exploited, which has been interesting with given given the Me Too movement that's come um, right. on since with which I'm completely sympathetic, obviously, but I didn't feel that I wasn't, I felt, I always felt in charge, I must say. And you point, you actually pointed that out. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's you, your roles, you've always played strong willed female characters that were independent, which is great. Um, I wanted to ask you in particular of your TV work because a lot of them I don't know. I'm not sure how many listeners we may have in the UK, and we can touch upon some of the other ones. But Blake Seven is one of my all-time favorite science fiction shows, and you did you did just one episode of that, right? Yeah, yeah, no, that's funny. That that was also that was also for um 
for a director I'd worked before. before. And I, I talk about, we talk about this here. I talk about Blake Seven quite a lot. I've just done a little recording for a guy uh, who runs a podcast about Blake Seven. It's astonishingly popular in retrospect. People love it. And I've gone to a few conventions of, of Blake Seven and the guys are amazing. Not the guys, just all of them, women and guys. Yeah. They are just amazing. They're, they're, they're almost a different breed, but they're also lovely. I always say the Blake Seven, Seven fans are the, are the most amazing ones. And uh, yeah, I got that. I got that because I worked in a in a series over here, a, a soap called Crossroads, and one of the directors went on to do Blake Seven, and he asked me to do it. It was a it was it's a tiny part, and it's not a very good part. And that was I was actually I, you know it's incomprehensible. It's, a, it's something called a mutoid, which is sort of almost an automaton, and I had incomprehensible lines. <laughs> it wasn't very satisfactory at all for me to do. Um, it wasn't at all satisfactory, and I, I um, you know, I, I turned up, and he, he took me to lunch, and he said, will you do this? I really want you to do this. And of course, you, if the director that you work for says that, you do. You say, oh, yes, of course. Um, but actually, it was a bit unsatisfactory. But it worked with a ha- I worked with a Hammer actress called Jacqueline Pierce. Oh, yeah. And she's actually wonderful in Blake Seven, and she's magnificent. I also worked in that episode with another English actor who I had admired for years and years and years, even before me, my mother had admired, called Michael Goff. So they were both these actors that I was working with every day in the rehearsal room, which was quite splendid, really. So, so it had its ups and downs. And then he gave me this costume to wear, which is hideous. So there we are. <laughs> it, it's amazing. Really? So, yeah, I remember, I remember Jacqueline Pierce, of course, with Serverland, the sort of the villain of the show. And um, yeah. Michael Goff, I remember him from a lot of horror movies. And especially uh, he played Alfred in the 1989 Michael Keaton Batman film. Um, oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah he, he was wonderful. He's a wonderful actor. Had a wonderful speaking voice, apart from anything else. Oh yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about some of these other shows. You mentioned Crossroads. I was going to bring up Coronation Street and The Professionals. Um, those are sh- shows that I'm familiar with the title and maybe an actor or two, but we've never actually had them here on our TV. No. No, there's no reason why you would. Coronation Street has been going for, and it's the longest running. So in Britain and it, in the early days, and I don't want to, I haven't seen it for years, but in the early days, it was, it was produced and directed at Granada Studios, which were up in Manchester in London, uh, in uh, Manchester away from London. And it was a sort of very, um, it was almost a political place. It was very, very, um, very aware, tremendous, uh, television company to work for and it was just I got nothing I mean my husband that I mentioned my first husband I should say Paul Freeman was working up in Liverpool at the time and we just newly got married so I went up to that area Manchester and Liverpool and so I got in touch with the casting directors of Granada Television so they they gave me a few little bit here and there um which was nice and Coronation Street was just like three lines with in 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 it was my first, one of my very first parts. But I did work for um, Michael Apted, who's a big director, oh, and yeah. um, Mike, another great, because Granada was a very much a breeding ground for people. There was an, an, another famous director called Mike somebody or other, who you'd know, but I can't remember his name, uh, who I also worked for. So I did a li- lots of little bits for Granada Television. Yes, that's true. That's how I started, really, in television. Excellent, excellent. That's so cool. Um, I wish we had some of these shows here. I mean, I I do for my for a living. I write soap opera news for a website, and it, but it just centers uh-huh. on the four American soap operas that are left. You know, <laughs> I'm always fascinated by <laughs> Coronation Street yeah. and stuff. I think they're wonderful. Yeah, I think they're wonderful. I don't watch them now because I just don't seem to get the right timing for it. But they're all good. They're all good. It's all right. Good. So um, you mentioned Confessions of a Window Cleaner earlier, and you also did another sort of a, a naughty comedy called Percy's Progress. Is that correct? Yes, I did. What can you tell us about those movies? Well, um, Confessions of a Window Cleaner, again, was a director that I'd worked for before in a series over here called The Adventurer with, um, what is the matter with my memory today? It's The Adventure with one of your actors, big uh, famous actor. Uh, hmm. And um, I worked... And, no, are you... Was it Robin uh, Asquith? Well, no. Scott, 
No, that was later. That was later. I'm talking about um, I'm talking about who I worked for in the adventurer with. I mean, and the director was um, Val Guest, who asked me to do Confessions of a Window Cleaner. So once again, you sort of do what the you know, if you're really flattered as an actress, somebody says, "Will you come and work for me again?" Because you're so fabulous. <laughs> Right, right. And The Adventurer had and, Gene um, Barry and Barry Morse in it, right? Uh, I, I, I enjoyed it. Sorry? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say G Gene Barry and Barry Morse were... Gene Barry. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Gene Barry. He was wonderful. Yeah. But I had a little scene with him, and, I, and Val Guest had directed that. Do you, uh, so that was good. Uh, I loved working with Gene Barry. It was only a day, but it was good. Uh, he, he brought Hollywood glamour into uh, British film studios. I, that's what I think, anyway. And then Confessions for Window Cleaning was just happened to be one of those things. It was fine. It's, it had Robin, who I'm very friendly with still, and um, he's really, really a clever actor. He's, he's, we, we shared an agent, which is probably why we worked together. He was also in um, the Flesh and Blood show. Oh, okay. And he'd worked for a lot of classy, classy, classy British, uh, British and Italian directors he, he done a lot of classy work but he he um he always tells a story about every young british actor turned down the part but he finally said yes after persuading because columbia um columbia took it over the production of it so yeah i did that and um it's probably my of all the stuff that i've done it's probably my least favorite actual performance she's a bit wet and i'm not sure i do it very well Hmm. Percy's Progress was a completely different thing, done at exactly the same time, uh, in the same studios. I have this image that I'm running between um, sets, really, in, in Elstree. Yeah, uh, and that was um, that was that was huge fun. That was just fun, really. Nice. It had the carry on people directing it, uh, Ralph Thomas, and yeah, it was it was huge fun. A lot of silly ladies dressed up. <laughs> but I didn't have very much to do, but I loved it. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, Val Guest directed uh, Confessions of a Window Cleaner, right? He did, yeah. Yeah. What was he like to work with? He's done a lot of great, you know, old sci-fi and horror movies. He was. He has a reputation, you know, Roger, of being a bit of a ladies' man and a bit difficult to work with in that way. Uh, I had no trouble with him. I worked with him twice, and he was just always respectful and... Um, yeah, he was he was he was very very professional, as you might expect with his with his backstory, and he knew exactly what he wanted to do. He was fine. I mean, confessions were window cleaning. He was completely professional and fine, and not at all, as I've said about Larouse. He wasn't at all sort of wireistic, but he has he does have a reputation, Val Guest, another part of him, of being a bit of a ladies' man. But that and that didn't come across with me. Well, that's good. That's good. So, I, real briefly, I just wanted to touch upon. I, I mentioned in the intro that you um, you were in a documentary called Peter Cushing in his own words, and I saw online in my research. Yes. There's another one. I I don't know. I, I I think it's a TV show called Behind the Scenes, and it was about Peter Cushing. Is that correct? Yes, I think it's uh, what that the second one is a, a sort of um, compilation, a, a sort of uh, pricey, if you like. An edited version of the other one. Oh, okay. They're both the same, except the behind the scenes is a smaller edited version of of the other one, the first one. Oh, I see. And how did that come about? That came <laughs> that came about the director Richard Edwards of Rabbit and Snail Films asked me, to, you know, to to go to Elstree and talk about my experience with Peter Cushing, and um, and I did that. Uh, as did uh, you know two or three other actresses other people and that's how he um he made this whole he he i'll tell you how it originally ended he he'd done an interview in fact i'm only i've just forgotten this when he was a young man he'd done an interview with peter cushing which he'd kept on the shelf for years and years and years and then he decided to make a whole sort of feature film of, around that interview that he did so, um, and which had never been published before or never been shown before. So he made a, a feature film documentary about Peter Cushing based on his interview with him and uh, had lots of people coming in and, and, and talking about them and, and extracts. I don't, I'm not sure how many 
uh, excerpts he could get. I think he found it quite difficult to get um, permission to get some of them. And the rights are difficult, but uh, it's it's quite a it's a rather wonderful documentary, and it did have um, an op- a very nice sort of premiere in London that that we went to. Nice, that's excellent. I mean, it's a great way to honor Peter Cushing, you know. I think so. I think so. It's amazing how much I think Peter Cushing would be amazed. Well, he's done the Star Wars thing, of course, so he's always going to be that guy there. Right. But he's it's amazing how it's amazing how revered he is. And then he did Star Wars. I mean, you know, so you know, but all of it is his his reputation is phenomenal. I wonder if he, you know, what he would think about that now. The fact that you and I are talking about him is just extraordinary. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm still blown away by the fact that you told me, you know, he could just switch it on and off. He could be nice as pie one second, and then he hears the word action, and he becomes the, the character he's playing in the movie. And I, I love that uh, ability to be able to do that, you know? Amazing. It is amazing. It's the opposite. <laughs> it's the opposite from some of these actors that you hear about, uh, um, you know, sort of having to spend the whole day getting into character. Right. Right, oh, that would be you know, method I mean, actors, I'm, right? Oh, my favorite actors. No, 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 no. Yeah, but Roger, they're my favorite actors. I can't knock that. I mean, Brando, Brando is my favorite actor. So I'm ne- never ever going to knock that method. But I, I read a, I read a quote from Brando today that just said, you know, any, any actor who talks about his process is talking rubbish. You know, you just get up and do it, which is the co- a different. Well, you, you don't really think of Brando just sort of getting up and doing it. You think of him maintaining his role. But he is my favorite actor, and they're my favorite films that he was in. So nice. So um, you did the haunting of Margam Castle in 2020. What can you tell us about that? Well, the director, the director is extremely prolific. He's done so many, and a lot of them go straight to video. But he, he, you know, he he has a huge success. Um with with those films and he just contacted me and asked me if i'd be do, if i'd be prepared i think he just wanted the names he had jane Merrow and he had caroline monroe uh, and i think he just wanted the publicity of having hammer actresses in his piece and he wrote a little part for me and um and it was just a little part that was sort of a bit irrelevant uh, i haven't I haven't seen the whole movie to tell you the truth it's it's just on video, um, but I haven't seen it all. I see my bits, obviously, yeah. <laughs> and Caroline's Caroline's bits. But um, he, he he's really prolific and successful. He hasn't been well the last couple of years, so he's actually had to take time off from making his extraordinary films that he makes, that are all thrillers and they're all beautifully shot, wonderfully professional, and generally they go straight to video. It was huge fun. Caroline and I travelled down. We stayed in the bed and breakfast down in Wales, and then we came back the next day. It was, uh, it was fun. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I watched the the movie. I enjoyed it. I thought it was very well done. He's definitely got an eye. Yeah, that was in- interesting. Right, right. Um, so I wanted to ask you about uh, the book Stunningly Savage, The Bloody Erotic Art of Rick Melton, where he painted an oil <laughs> picture of you, right? <laughs> he did. He did. Yeah. yeah, I've got a picture of it just outside the room I'm sitting in. Uh, yeah, he did, he did. He did. He's done nearly every, almost every actress you can think of, but particularly Hammer Horror Stars and particularly, and he's actually so clever. He does all the art for those films we discover. You know, there's a lot of horror films that go out, British horror films that are really good, and he does a lot of the art for them. And he's a really great artist in my view and he honored me by doing one of those things for me and um i think it's brilliant and it's sitting outside of my just (laughs) just outside the spare room and the stairs and it's a brilliant picture he's he's done i think he's done every horror hammer horror actress um painted them and i hope he's earned some money from it he's he's brilliant that's amazing yeah and so did he did he contact you to get permission before he did the painting, or did he do it first and then show it to you? No, 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 he did. He did. He, I, there was there was a contact. I think it might have been through. There's a wonderful uh, festival um, in London 
every every year called Dark Fest, and he he is the he's often there because he's the illustrator of Dark Fest magazines that they do. And um, I th- I don't know how he contacted me, but he did contact me, and he asked me which of my pictures would he would I like him to to use as 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 the you know the model really. And I sent him two or three of my vaguely sexy things that I'd had done in the 60s and 70s, 70s really. And uh, he chose that one. He said, I'll do this one. He's such a, he's, he's a real um, perfectionist in some ways because he sent me original, he sent me the original one and he had a moon and it had bats and he sent me a second one and said, actually, I think the bats flying around your head are too much. So I've taken them out. So he's, uh, he's, He's he's a perfectionist, and he did of course ask me, and I uh, I'm, I'm no he didn't pay me. In fact, I paid him for the copy of my film <laughs> uh, of his his picture. I mean, not my film, his picture. Right, right. Oh my God! So you've done so many things <laughs> over the years. Something, Roger. What are you asking about that? That's an odd thing to ask about. I've never been asked about Rick Milton before. Uh, well, it came up in my research, and I was curious. <laughs> I saw the picture online, and it's really well done. Yeah, it is. It is. It, well, he's done. He's done every horror actress. Yeah. So you've done like a ton of stuff in your life throughout the years. Um, the the one thing that sort of stands out to me too is, uh, when you went to uh, uh I'm gonna screw this up here. Was it South Africa? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, and you lived you lived there for a while, and you did acting um, in theater for a whole season. How how did all that come about, and what made you stay? I, no, no, I didn't. I didn't do acting. I didn't do acting uh, for the whole season. What happened was, and briefly, not very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I met a boy. I met a boy after my marriage broke up. Um, probably quite a long time after my marriage broke up to Paul Freeman. Um, I met a boy. And he was a South African, and he said to me, "How would you like to drive through Africa?" Because he drove Land Rovers, that's what he did. He was actually a dentist. He was that cliche South in, in Britain. South African dentists are at a premium. He is a dentist, and he said, "How would you like to drive through Africa?" That is from London to Kenya, and we drove. It took six months, and it was very, very difficult to be doing that with one other person who you had only just met. I can tell you it was a tough, tough old six months. And then I worked in a theatre in Kenya down there because I walked into the Kenya and the guy knew who I was and he said, will you come and work for me for a little while? And that, that went on. That was Kenya. But we didn't go down to South Africa because at the time it, it still had apartheid. Okay. So we didn't. And then I, I, fl- uh, I he, he, uh, we both flew back separate times because I was working in the theatre. Um, and then, uh, to cut a long story short, I married that guy. <laughs> I married my de- South African, I married my South African dentist and we settled down and we had two beautiful, beautiful girls. And then when, uh, apartheid finished, I was taken out for dinner by my dentist and he said, uh, I want to move to South Africa. How do you feel about that? And I thought, well, wow. So this is a bit of an opportunity. <laughs> There's this middle aged woman and me. So I went down, and we, so we moved to South Africa. But there was no acting involved. There was no, uh, there was nothing, nothing involved with acting at all. Nobody down there knew anything about me, um, and, and we stayed for I think about twelve years, and then we came back because my oldest daughter, I wanted her to go to university over here, and we we've, we've come back uh, and live here, much to my South African dentist disappointment. Cause he'd rather <laughs> be there, but there we are. You probably don't need to know that, but that's how it <laughs> happened. So the two things didn't happen together. The first thing was very early on after the trip, the, oh, okay. the early trip through in, in 89, and then I worked in the theatre there. So the two are not connected, and there was no showbiz in South Africa at all. Right, right. Okay, that makes sense. That What's was... amazing, Rod, is when I've come back, I mean, you know, I think we came back in 2000, uh, um, oh, I can't exactly remember, shortly, uh, 2002, 2003 or something like that. Um, the inter- and, you know, I am, I'm only sitting here talking to you because of the internet. Right. 
you know otherwise you wouldn't and i you know the internet's taken off and it took oh, obviously taken off but i mean it took off then and suddenly my films and my face was all over the internet so um so you know it was weird and then you know somebody said well i know her and then i was invited to a convention and it sort of took off and all the stuff that you're talking about is in on the internet because before that uh, you know in the in the late 70s the, even the 80s there was no internet with my name on it at all right thank, thank you internet <laughs> <laughs> it must be very flattering to, to realize that it, you've got these people that are so interested in your life and your career. Oh, Roger, it's mind-boggling. I mean, it's so wonderful. It is, of course, extremely flattering. And it is, uh, it is extraordinary. I mean, it never ceases. When I go to conventions, which I do quite a lot, I'm, I, I never cease to be amazed at, at, at the people who come, you know. And sometimes you get students coming and they're doing they're doing phds even or masters in um british films of the 70s or british horror films or horror film they're doing that as one of their subjects and you know the one thing they want to do is talk to you about it it's immensely flattering as you said earlier that's great that's so cool hopefully someday i'll get to meet you at one of these conventions um oh i hope so i'm waiting to go to america funnily enough one of the um one of the you know the people who book you asked me three years ago to go to something in america i can't remember what it was and then of course covid came up so i didn't get to go so maybe sometime i'll come over to america to a convention that would be nice that would be excellent excellent and speaking of covid that actually leads into my next question which we'll start to wrap things up here shortly um but you did a lot of stuff in the lockdown do you want to talk about um, some of what you did? I was surprised about that. I must say, I did do. I did. Um, I did. I did. I did a. I did a, um, a Q and A, which actually the Misty Moon, which I'm pa pa patron of, asked me to do. Would I do a, a, a Q and A sitting in my spare bedroom on Zoom? And I said, well, nobody's going to be interested. So, um, and they said, oh no, they will. They will. Let's do it. We did it, and there were people from. There's a lovely guy from America, a lovely guy from Australia. They were all tuning in, so that was hugely successful for me. And then I did, yeah, it's surprising. Uh, I did, um, I did a weird thing on. Um, I I just used audio actually. He a guy asked me to do do a little speech, um, a Bond girl, and I said to him, well. This, uh, you know, I can't. I don't think I can do this on video, but I do know some bond, bon, real bond girls. Right. But uh, and I gave, I gave it to Caroline, but Caroline couldn't do it. She was not well, and she didn't. She was interested, but she didn't want to do it. So in the end, the guy um, put it up, and uh, he put it up over my pictures, and I read, read it, and that was quite an interesting thing to do. Uh, one one of the nicest things I did was a, a little, a tiny little film with a famous actor over here called Tony Robinson, um, which was about to raise awareness of dementia because it was written by a cartoonist over here whose father had died with dementia. And he's quite a well-known, very, very successful cartoonist called Tony Husband. And he got a little film together and I played the wife of the main guy, who was a guy called Tony Robinson, an actor over here who's very famous. Mm -hmm. And it's called Joe's Journey, and it's out there on the internet. And uh, that was a very nice thing to do. And I also did this film, I think I did it a little earlier than, called Keeping the British End Up, which we're going to be publicising in Leicester Square on Saturday, which is going to come out in the autumn. And it is a sort of praise, it's a sort of a look at all the sex comedies british sex comedies right of which there were a huge amount um and i did i did an interview with it and so did everybody you can ever think of actually um robin asquith did linda hayden did francoise pascal did it all sorts of people did did this film and so it'd be really interesting to see it we're doing a q a on saturday in leicester square the prince charles cinema which is quite exciting it's also my birthday. Oh, well, happy birthday in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Oh, my God. Well, we could probably go on for another couple hours, but I'm going to let you go here soon. Um, you did mention some stuff. Are there any other upcoming projects that you want to talk about? Are you at liberty to speak about? 
No, there's none apart from this film that I'm talking about, which will get its premiere in the autumn. Um, I've got none, no. Somebody needs to offer me something. <laughs> Before well, I die of old age, no. But, uh, you know, uh, Roger, I just, um, I'm not really looking for work. Oh, yes, I've got, I've got, actually, I've got definitely, definitely, I've got um, two festivals, a wonderful festival in Manchester called the Fantastic Film Festival, which is the one I mentioned at the beginning. I hope they may have got a copy of that original film that I did, The Exquisite Cadaver. That is over Halloween. And the week before that, I'm judging, I'm helping to judge, I'm one of the judges at uh, an international film festival at the Cinema Museum in in London. So that and that's Misty Moon uh, Festival. I've actually judged that for the last probably 10 years with other people. They often get American actresses doing it uh, as well that, that come over. So that's quite exciting. So, yes, I, actually, I am doing a few things now I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, Judy, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I'm so glad you, you were able to join me today. Where can the listeners find you online? Um. Oh, well, there's Judy Mathis on Facebook, which is public. It's, just, it's um, and they can do that. And on Twitter, I'm Judy Jarvis, and I'm very, very available on Twitter. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, you've mentioned it quite a bit today. I'm going to have to check out some of I'm those not, things. That I you think mentioned. I've been on it quite a bit today. I've been a few things today on it. That's why. And also, I do rather love it. <laughs> excellent, excellent, awesome. Well, Judy, you have an open invitation to come back on the show anytime you want. If there's something you want to talk about or something you want to pr promote, you know. Um, Thank you, Roger. And, you know, if you want, maybe if you're up for it, at some point we can discuss, like we can take an episode and dissect one of your movies, um, you know, at a time, if, if you're up for that. But that would be something fun for the future. Whenever you want to do that. It's been lovely talking to you. I mean, uh, and I would like to listen to your podcast of, of generally, but also with, with this one on. So you must let me know when it's on. Excellent. Yep. I'll send you the link and it's, it's on all the uh, podcasting apps and also on our website and I'll send you all that stuff and we'll put your contact info in the show notes so people can, can look you up as well. Brilliant, Roger. It's been lovely talking to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed this interview with amazing Scream Queen and horror icon Judy Matheson. Be sure to check out her films, many of which are on Tubi as of this recording. So if you don't already know, we've started up a new monthly live streaming show. Bill Van Ryn from Groovy Doom and the Drive-In Asylum Double Feature and I have teamed up to host a streaming video show called Fright Lounge in which we discuss all horror media. If you're unsure if you want to get into horror or are a seasoned horror fan, this is the show for you. You can check out the details at havenpodcasts.com, and the Fright Lounge link is on the right. Fright Lounge also has a Facebook page at facebook.com slash Fright Lounge, which will keep you up to date on all our broadcasting dates and times. We'll be live on Facebook and YouTube simultaneously. And I just wanted to remind you that Patreon is the place where you can support artists. We've got some great stuff going on at our Patreon page, including our exclusive filmmaker series where we talk to writers, directors, producers, and basically anybody behind the scenes in film and television. So be sure to check out the Patreon link on our website and help support your favorite pop culture show. It's only three bucks, the same price as a cup of coffee. And when you sign up, you'll be entered into a monthly contest to win Sean Kanan's book, Way of the Cobra. For those who don't know, Sean was the villain Mike Barnes in Karate Kid 3, as well as playing A.J. Quartermain on General Hospital, Deacon Sharp on The Bold and the Beautiful, and tons of other roles. It's a great deal, so check it out. And while you're on our site, please click on the Tee Public link to get some fun merch. We've got our new classes in session design up. Well, it's not that new anymore, but we've got new designs coming, so grab them now. We also want your feedback on the show, so please email us at thenisnow42 at gmail.com. You can also join in the conversation at our Facebook Then Is Now podcast group. Then Is Now podcast is a proud member of the Dorkening Podcast Network, so be sure to check out the other great shows there at thedorkeningpodcastnetwork.com. Also on our website at havenpodcasts.com is our sister show, The East Meets the West, in which we discuss Shaw Brothers films and Spaghetti Western movies. 
And Then Is Now is on YouTube, so please visit youtube.com slash user slash Uncle Death One to get the latest videos as well as other fun videos. Please subscribe to our YouTube page and also share it with your friends and get them to subscribe as well. And don't forget to hit that little bell so you can get notifications when we put out new videos. Also, if you could, and if you like this show, please go to wherever you download your podcast from and leave us a great review so that more listeners can find us. You can find us on all the podcasting apps, especially the big three, iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Class dismissed. The Miss Now Podcast is intended for entertainment, educational, and informational purposes only. Sounds, music, and clips played during this podcast are the property of their copyright holders. All original content is copyright Jupiter Media. shows like the one you just heard check out the dorkening podcast network at the dorkening.com